Hello, everyone. I'm Jenna Roll, the Director of Education at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Welcome to Science Pub from Home. And thank you for joining us this Valentine's Day evening. Personally, nothing makes my heart pitter patter quite like some riveting science content. <laughs> uh, we look forward to seeing you in March for our next Science Pub from Home Garden Allies with former Santa Barbara Botanic Garden Director of Education, Frederic Lavio Pierre on March 14th. Uh, Frederic's book, Garden Allies, the insects, birds, and other animals that keep your garden beautiful and thriving is available for purchase in our very own museum store. Um, so while we wait once again for the world to become a safer place, please continue to support your favorite local businesses like our museum store and Dargan's Irish Pub. All right, so tonight I am excited to introduce marine ecologist and passionate educator, Dr. Michelle Paddock. Michelle is a professor of marine sciences at Santa Barbara City College, co-founder and senior conservation scientist with One People, One Reef, and expedition leader on natural history and citizen science trips with Oceanic Society. Links to both of those organizations can be found in the chat. Michelle's research focuses on interactions between corals, reef fishes and humans with the goal of facilitating actions to support sustainable and vibrant ecosystems rooted in natural and cultural diversity. In this presentation, she will share the successes of the One People, One Reef collaborative program in the outer islands of Yap State, Federation uh, States of Micronesia. This work celebrates the knowledge and leadership of local communities supported by modern science to restore critical coral reef habitat and resources across a vast archipelago in the Western Pacific. Activism, science, and collaboration across cultures are key to conservation successes as we enter a new and vital chapter in global conservation efforts. Thank you so much for joining us on this perfect evening. Dr. Paddock, please, when you're ready, take it away. Okay, so firstly, I just want to thank you for inviting me tonight. I am so honored to finally get a chance to do a science pub for you all and um, it's such an incredible experience. And so I'm so grateful to the Natural History Museum for bringing together people for these incredible conversations. So um, what I want to do first too is also express my gratitude and really give credit where credit is due. And this is truly a story from the voices of the people of Yap and her outer islands. And it is these communities who are sharing so much, um, including this story that I'll share with you tonight with the world. And the thing about stories is that's so beautiful is that there's always a different place where you can start a story. And it's so beautiful to see how stories, even old stories can weave together in new ways. And so tonight I thought I'd start the story in a slightly different place with um, a conversation about, well, let's talk a bit about this whole system and really root in what this is about. And this is about people. This is about change, change in ecosystems, change in cultures. It's about sharing knowledge and it's about collaborating to solve these really wicked problems that are arising through incredibly complex social and ecological systems. So we'll start the story with me since I'm your storyteller for the evening. And um, I grew up in Washington DC, sailing and swimming in the Chesapeake Bay with an incredible father, it's my dad there, uh, my favorite Valentine, and an amazing family who really instilled some some pieces, some values that are really the best Valentines ever, like the spirit of curiosity and the recognition of the deep importance of family and community and working together to, to get things done. And of course, an, an unending and vast love of nature, especially the nature that's in the ocean. I just was born in love with the oceans and my love for it gets richer every day. And so this combination of 
loving the ocean and being curious, of course, the only logical thing is to become a marine biologist. I love being a scientist. I love the ex exploration and discovery and getting so much intimate time with this place that I love. But I also really love humans and the chance to share my knowledge and experiences in both formal educational settings as well as as well as non-traditional settings is just a, a gift that I really, really feel so grateful for. So I want to share some of that with you tonight. And really, it's also deeply rooted in friendship. So really, really briefly, the origin of this is that when I first moved to California, literally some of the first people I met are in this photograph. And this is the core of this work. It grew out of those friendships. And those friendships have led to collaboration and incredible work. So this is the kind of core team, um, just from left to right. That's um, myself. This is John Rumold Jr., an incredible leader of, of everybody in Ulithi at all. This is Nicole Crane and the incredible powerhouse behind this. This is Peter Nelson, Giacomo Bernardi, and Birgit Winning, who really is the nexus point for the first point of contact out on the island. So though this has grown and there are so many more people than even pictured here, but One People, One Reef has become an incredible team of people coming together from all different experiences and places to really bring in so much help, just so much tireless volunteering. I can't even begin to express my gratitude and joy that I get to work with such an incredible global community. So let's talk about this incredible global community. The oceans, such an amazing ecosystem in itself. And within the oceans, of course, there are the coral reef ecosystems, which are ecosystems that actually cover less than 1% of the planet, yet are, are holding over 65% of the biodiversity on this planet. Really, truly amazing places. Yet, I'm sure you all know that these systems are suffering. They are deeply endangered. We are seeing incredible losses of these ecosystems all across the globe, we are seeing reefs dying and suffering under the weight of development and climate change. It is heartbreaking and really difficult ecosystems to work in to be witnessing this demise. But as we lose ecosystems, we have to remember that there is another cost. It's not just nature, it's us. Across the world, we're seeing entire cultures, languages, traditional knowledge being lost, in some places going extinct before they're barely even known. And this is particularly acute in cultures who are in island nations that are so vulnerable. And so when we think about this, it's really important to think about that these diverse ecosystems are linked to the diverse traditional practices. These are coupled systems. Nature arose into this incredible biodiversity and from that biodiversity arose one species which has birthed thousands and thousands of cultures. And those cultures were rooted within those ecosystems. These are coupled systems. We shape each other. And when we start to lose one, we weaken the other. And so we are seeing this this link between cultural extinctions and biological extinctions. So when we think about indigenous peoples, even though they may be a small proportion of the number of people on our planet, they are stewards of a huge amount of the biodiversity of our planet. And this is especially true about coral reefs, since so much of that biodiversity is contained within those coral reefs, and so many of them are part of the, the intimate habitat of people in ecosystems. 
And so if we want to conserve coral reefs, if we want to protect these ecosystems and rebuild them, it's not about just jumping in with some highfalutin Western ideas. It's about working together with the people who live there, the people who are depending and have been depending on these ecosystems for thousands and thousands of years. And if we want success, that's the path forward. So let's go. I want to take you to the Federated States of Micronesia. So if we, here we are in California, if you fly, let's take a little stop in Hawaii and go into this, this region of the world. And most of you, if you looked at the map right now, you wouldn't even see islands there. There are hundreds and hundreds of islands out there that don't show up on a normal map, but here they are. So there's four states in the Federated States of Micronesia. The Western one, most one is the state of Yap. And you may have heard of this part of the world because that's where James Cameron launched his Explorer Deep, uh, his Challenger Deep expedition some years ago. So th this is a map of Yap State. You can see that there's many islands all across here, and I'm um, including several atolls. An atoll is a circle of islands, um, of coral reefs. And this will be focusing here on Ulithi Atoll, which is one of the, the largest atolls in the world. It's about 22 miles long by about 15 miles wide. And so we'll focus here. So the original, the original connection was one of concern. So we were invited to come to take a look at these reefs. We were invited as a, as a few marine biologists because the real concern was that the reefs seem to be dying and those reefs supply the majority of food for people on these islands and they saw those resources declining and really wanted to find a way to improve their own lives and ecosystems but also really recognizing that their communities were starting to degrade and so a strong desire to find a solution to move forward. So just a little bit about these communities. They are incredibly traditional communities, really deeply tied to traditions and practices that go back thousands of years. It's, it's a really powerful place to visit. These islands, many of them are remote. Many of them you can only reach by boat. And, um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a way of life that is so vastly different from ours but it's not immune to the touch of what we do in, in the world. And in fact, World War II made a particularly strong impact on Ulithi Atoll because the United States took it over from Japan who was its protectorate then and um, amassed over 700 naval warships inside this lagoon, which gives you a sense of how large the lagoon is. And they literally fenced the lagoon off and also what you see down in the lower right hand of your screen is Mogmog, which is one of the most sacred islands across all of Yab State. And that was um, defoliated to be an R&R &R place for the troops. So definitely a big and lasting impact of history. And now moving forward, we see that in this time since the war, we see um, the arrival on the islands of many new technologies, some of them very welcome, like boat engines, um, but many also where there are technologies that create a conflict of, of what's happening in the in the way we use the ecosystem. And so we're seeing this degradation of some of the traditional practices where there are many different methods and dwindling to a few and changing in power structures because now the person with the engine and the fuel might be more important in decision making than or more influential in decision making than a chief might be. So a change in the way that society is structured by just that introduction of one thing. And of course, the biggest part of being recognizing that the reefs are falling apart, these vibrant ecosystems full of every kind of fish and crab and slug and worm and 
anything that you can imagine are degrading and in that degradation losing the fishes that are the very backbone of the food for people on these islands so a big source of concern and of course of course climate change is is a really really deep concern here because these islands are very low lying. So these are people who are at risk of losing the entirety of their historical lands that they live upon as we, we can watch erosion happening in real time on these islands. But that is also strongly impacting their food resources. This is a picture of a taro patch and saltwater intrusion as sea level rise um, can really rot the taro. And so it is destabilizing food resources for, for these communities. So these are big, sticky problems. How do we solve them? We can't solve them till we understand them a little bit. We understand what's going on. And it's not up to us alone to solve them. This is a collaboration. So before I tell you more about that collaboration, I want to make one thing really clear because there was a word in uh, our advertisement for this talk that sometimes can be a problematic word and that is the word conservation. And so as we step into this, remember that what conservation means to you might not mean the same thing to an indigenous person living and relying upon the reefs of their island. And the very approaches and how we look at doing conservation, whereas here it might be, hey, this is a great method to just basically say, nobody ever fish here again, that's great. Okay, we're, we did something great. That might not be the right approach in different ecosystems. And so we, we have to recognize that our languaging and our approaching is not necessarily cross-cultural. And so it's important to really think about the lens of which we're approaching. And I think that that is what this quote so aptly brings in, is that we need to value that holistic indigenous knowledge. Those knowledge system and ways of life have so much to offer to finding a solution moving forward. And it's really working together. That's gonna to allow this to happen. And so in all of this and in everything we do, it's the community and it's their needs that are the guide. And every day we ask ourselves, how can we support their management capacity, their decision-making processes? And then in turn, they're asking themselves and asking us, hey, how can we contribute to global efforts towards sustainable ecosystems? Because we recognize that we are all connected by one ocean. So the very core of all of this is to listen. That was the first thing when we sat down and talked about what we were gonna do, this was what we decided. We would listen and we would listen deeply and we listen in many different ways. So the first one is listening to each other, to sit in community and gather together and just create a space where they can share their concerns and what's going on, some of their history with us. So we spend always, always, it's a priority to spend a lot of time sitting in community. And not just in the larger community, but we listen by doing individual interviews and surveys. We do, we've done some formal social, social science surveys. And in all of that, from the very get-go, we realized that it's these traditional management frameworks that we started to learn about and also started to share memories of because some of them were being lost and we would dig them up in, in old literature. These are forming the foundation for our approach and our questions and really rooting this in history. So here's an example of some of the data that we got from a sociological um, survey that we did. And you can hear the concerns of the community that some of the biggest issues are how are we managing our fishery, our resources? And, and, and this word, by the way, management, that really refers to what's happening on their reefs that they fish, since again, this is 90% of the food 
that they are getting. And connected to that is exactly looking at how we fish and that there's changes in how we fish that are likely really impacting the ecosystem. So what we do is then we, often when we're in community, we have maps with us and we're asking people to draw on the map or show us on the map, hey, we're, you know, and so they'll be making notes and we'll map out them all onto the reefs thinking, what, how many people are here? How many people were here? When has there been a big problem? Is there, oh, here's a reef where we feel like there's poison because everybody gets sick when they eat these fish. So what does that mean? So we map them onto that whole ecosystem of the reefs. And then of course, who do we listen to next? The reefs themselves. We go out and we let the reefs tell their stories. We try to drop our construct of anything that we've heard or seen in any other place and look at it with novel eyes. And we have many, many different ways in which we survey these reefs. Um, there's a picture of me just breath hold diving because it's too remote for scuba. Um, collecting data on all the corals, which is um, one of the big pieces that I contribute to, but you can also see that we're taking genetic samples um, and the community, by the way, is engaged in that to help us understand how the reefs are connected to each other, to understand how the populations are doing, and we're using more technology as well. So there's many, many different ways. All of them designed to start looking at what we've heard about. <clears throat> so here's a little bit of results. So here is all of you Lithi Atoll. Again, that's about 22 miles by 15 or so. And you can see that there's many different islands all across this atoll. We surveyed over 30 sites around the atoll. We've started in 2012 and we have data all the way up until the pandemic. And we can see that all across the atoll, no one reef is the same. And so there's, there's some reefs that look similar to each other and some that look vastly different. And so here's just an example of our data, and I won't belabor you with all of the nitty gritty details, but one of the things, I mean, this is what a geeky scientist gets excited about is that all of the coral data that Nicole and I collected, and then all of the fish data that Giacomo collected, and we, we put them into two separate analyses to see how the islands would group and if they're more similar to each other. And the groups, the clusters came out almost exactly the same. So we have three main clusters and you can see this big difference between these groups of islands. So there's some reefs that are on the uninhabited islands that are facing the oceanic side. And you can see this incredible coral diversity and structure and great fish biomass. And then there are inhabited oceanic islands where the corals aren't as popul populous um, the fish aren't as populous, but they're still looking pretty good structurally. And then these inhabited areas right off of the villages where the reefs are much flatter, the resources, the fishes are much less abundant. And so if we look at that a little more closely, you can see those are those three clusters. So those are the high percent of coral on those outer reefs and then the lower amount. But then when we drill in and look at who's who, we can see there's a big difference in the kinds of corals on each of the reefs. And what we have in red here is this discovery that was born forth from some of the stories that we heard of community members being really concerned about one particular species of coral that they said was taking over reefs and causing the reefs to decline. And we identified this as a species of Montipra, but it's a highly unusual thing to be happening. Um, we're pretty sure it's a, it's a native coral, so not an invasive species. And, and indeed, our data corroborated the story that the islanders said that these reefs are facing strong declines in the species diversity of everything and also in their ability to, to provide food fish. And so this is a whole study in itself that I could spend an evening talking about, um, but I'll leave it there for now. But there's some amazing research where we're looking at um, this, this coral from an ecological perspective, we have exciting new work looking at it, at the metal bomics of it, at the genomics of it, and really trying to get a handle on what causes one species to start acting up like this. 
So of course then, I mean, who doesn't want to talk to a fish and hear the stories that they tell? And so we can see, as I mentioned before, those outer islands with a really nice, just great biomass of fish still and those inner ones off the villages, much, much lower amount and changing proportions. Piscivores are those big, you know, the, the fish that you like to catch and eat like grouper and jacks and the herbivores are things like this cute parrotfish here. So all of that information, now let's get come back together. Let's meet in community again and share it. And that's what we do. We share what we've seen. We talk about it. We show pictures um, to get some insight. And we also share our knowledge. We listen to, hey, what do you guys know about this fish? Oh, well, did you know this about it? And so we have this conversation. Hey, let's look inside these fish and see what's going on inside of them. So really rich and dynamic conversation created there. And and in that is discussing the impacts of these changes in fishing methods. And so just to give you a quick example of that, these are spear guns, which is not a traditional fishing method. And um, of course, gill nets and monofilament line aren't either. And so just the use of spear guns has changed what kind of fish they catch and the impact on the reef by the fact that they're targeting parrot fishes, which are really, really critical for reef health or just instead of sailing, using an engine allows you to fish areas that during the windy season you couldn't get to and so had a rest. So big impacts on the ecosystems, which led us to this recognition that, oh my gosh, knowing what and when and how you fish is, will be an incredibly insightful thing. So we need, we need to find a way to get that information. And so who better to get that information than the islanders themselves? The community members have stepped up and become local scientists. We facilitated some workshops to teach them how to collect data. And there's, there's people on every island who are assigned as the lead fisheries scientist. And this has led to the largest artisanal fisheries database known, I think, on the planet. Um, incredible record keeping, just an amazing initiative by people who are working hard just to feed their communities and they're stopping before they eat to measure these fish and take data on them. And so then they give us these data back and we get to figure out how to analyze that and how to interpret it. And I'll just give you a quick example of what that looks like. This was just some data that we found early on, which you don't need to know all these different fish, but the bottom line is that these were the most fish, the species that were most caught. And those are all herbivorous fishes, which means that the community has been degraded and overfished. And we can also look at how big those fish are when they become sexually mature and what size they're catching on, catching them. And then we see immediately here that this little chub, they're catching them mostly as babies, which of course, as you can imagine, would be quite problematic to the sustainability of that fishery. So really important conversations that are coming out of their very own data. And so this is the crux of it is how do we have this conversation and that recognition that the fishing has changed. As I mentioned, it's becoming less diverse in the fishing gear that's being used and in the fishes that are caught. And this is creating new problems. And so some of the traditional management might need to be looked at and so it could apply, but there might be some new management that would be useful to address these new problems. And even though we see that cultural practices are being lost, we see that there's a strong foundation that remains. And that's really important because that allows us and them to move forward in a way and by taking this information becoming empowered to make really good informed decisions. So that resource management is this, I see it as this beautiful bridge between the past and the present and the future. And so every island, even islands that are very close to each other, they have their own unique culture. They have their own unique habitat within that ecosystem, even though it seems like, oh, this is one atoll. And so each of them is going to have a different approach. And so every island might have different tools that they start employing. And so this is just an example of some of the combination of traditional fishing, fisheries resource management and new ways. 
of looking at them. And so <clears throat> I want to share an example, and there's always so much to share, it's hard to keep this quickly, but I want to share one really powerful example. And this is the Philalapi Lithi, um, is the island, Junior's Island, and um, they came together, they were the, the ones that first really reached out and, and took the initiative to see what they could do. And after our first visit, they decided to close fishing on a huge part of their island, which we were worried was, was going to be a problem. But because how do you stop fishing so much of the area and still have food to eat? But they decided that they would do this because they saw those resources declining. And lo and behold, within a year, they saw their fishes just bouncing back, their reefs bouncing back. It was just this incredible excitement of seeing species that they hadn't seen for years and really seeing this as these ecosystems really responsive to doing some little changes within how we use this, the resource. So that was pretty exciting. And then in 2015, a really terrifying event happened. A super typhoon went right over Ulithi Toll and just devastated these islands. Every building smashed, every boat smashed. Amazingly, no human lives were lost, but a really big impact. When we went there just a couple of months later, everybody was still reeling in shock. And when we sat in community with them, they shared with us very uncomfortably that they felt bad because they decided that they needed to fish in that area that they said that they would let sit for a while. And of course, they were cut off from the world. Their boats were gone. Of course, they had to fish there. And so we asked them, well, how was it? And they said, we fed everyone. That moment of just recognizing that a decision made only two years before literally saved their lives was just such a powerful moment. And this is the tagline for One People, One Reef. The Ulithian name for this group of us doing this work is Hofagi Lamale, which means unite this atoll. And this community truly is the community that's led the way. And now really seeing all of the islands across the atoll, all of the islands across Yap State are so engaged and excited because they see how powerful making a little change can be. And they recognize that what one community does can have ripple effects in a really positive way to other communities. And so they are indeed all truly connected to each other even if distances separate them. So let's bring this to the most important part of the story. The most important part is who is this for? And this is who it's for. It's for the youth. It's for our future of where we are on this planet. And one of the things that we discovered in our conversations was that there is a disconnect amongst the generations. A lot of the elders felt like the youth just didn't care anymore. A lot of the youth were being swayed and more attracted to Western culture and wanting to leave and not wanting to honor chiefs and thinking that their wisdom was useless and outdated. And so it was this disintegration as well as a quick loss of the, the traditional knowledge as many of the elders were dying due to degrading health conditions due to westernization. And when there are so many of the youth leaving the islands, your culture flying away, where do you go from there? How do you rebuild that? Well, the way to rebuild it was directly with the youth. The youth, we started a youth group and the youth have been come engaged. We're bringing youth together from here, a lot of community college students from California, bringing them out to the Micronesian islands and working with youth in, on the on Lithi Atoll, engaging together, sharing cultural knowledge, understanding a little bit about each other and understanding the value of each of their cultures, engaging and doing science and learning about their ecosystem and trying new things and finding ways 
to, to really step up as future leaders. And we're seeing this, this has just been the most amazing program where we are seeing some of these young men who have just stepped up and become incredible leaders even now within our program. They are, they are becoming the leaders in their communities. They're charting a way forward. They're beginning to see the incredible richness of their own culture and the knowledge and value that can be brought forth. They're, they're women that are being inspired to become scientists and more teachers. And it's just, it's just a, I can't even begin to tell you how exciting it is to work with these youth every day. And so one of the really amazing things that we've had the opportunity to do was we got a little grant from the National Geographic to start getting the stories, listening to and recording the stories from the elders and start to document them and start to try to understand them so that we could better understand culture, but also preserve those stories before they're lost. And this has been a really amazing piece. And if you want to read or even hear some of those stories yourself, you can go to our website and we've got them all there. But the real beauty of those stories is storytelling together. And so one of the big pieces of conversation and actually one of the great things that started before COVID happened, but because of COVID, we've been able to have these Zoom meetings with the youth that are on islands that have some internet and, and really talk about these stories and dig into them and understand them and their relevance. And we are creating conversations. So this is a new initiative that we're doing, which I, I, I welcome you to join us in our first Zoom conversation. Um, with the youth, we are inviting Larry Ragatal, who is a master canoe carver and an incredible holder and teacher of traditional seafaring methods. And so we're going to be in Zoom conversation with him and youth from across all of Micronesia, but housed all across the world and, and the American youth who are excited to be a part of this. And we also really feel strongly that these stories need to be shared more wildly, even within community. And so we just launched a really exciting initiative, which I welcome you to check out and, and help support if you have the capacity to do that, where we are trying to create videos and really write down and find ways to, to package these stories to make sure that they're preserved and to make sure that they can be shared across across all the communities and really talk about that connection of what are those threads in the story and how do we hear that as, as how can we put that together with how we are living in our ecosystem today and what does that story tell you about what we know about turtles and moving forward. So a really exciting and rich piece that I, we you are welcome to take part in. So that, I think I said a lot really fast, but I hope that it really is just, I know it's just a drop in the bucket and a big sweep of a welcome to what we do, but I want to, um, before I converse with you, um, just to kind of end with this thought. When we, this is a beautiful graph I love from Lowe and Harmon where it shows this, you know, time, rooted in the past and kind of the tree of life where diverse, diverse ecosystems grow and then that one branch of humans and all of the culture, cultural diversity that's birthed out of that. And so I see communities and when we, we are empowered by cultural heritages within our communities, when we are informed by that biocultural knowledge, by shared knowledge from across different communities and systems, and when we are engaged as interactive and vital members of our ecosystem, of our planet, then we can co-create a world that is sustainable and resilient due to the richness of both our ecological and biological diversity and our cultural diversity. And we have a future of this incredible youth that we can hand them these vibrant and thriving ecosystems that are intact with the richness of their own culture 
and they can forge forward in this new world. And that, my friends, is the best Valentine I can imagine. So thank you, Machichig. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of the support that we've had for this. And I will stop sharing my screen and welcome conversation with you. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. That was inspiring and amazing work. Uh, I, it, I, it's incredible. So thank you. Um, we had a question from Sue about how to join the March 4th Master Canoe Building Zoom event. Um, I believe that Ileana put the link in the chat. Um, are our guests able to follow that link to join? Thank you. Ileana is our amazing support incredibleness. <laughs> so she put the link there and um, I'd be happy to, to share the slides out there. I mean, we put a QR code, but you can just go to the website and click on that and it should take you there. I'm excited. Larry's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we had a question from someone regarding lagoons. So they were asking, do you have data from uninhabited lagoons, um, being that lagoons are typically less diverse due to lower water flow and turbulence? Yes. Yes. So one of the things, one just to correct, so when we're talking about like in the atoll, the whole space on the inside is like the lagoon. So with the particular data that I was sharing right now, those were islands where there were some islands that are inhabited and some that aren't. And so the lagoonal side of those, of those islands differ. We do see differences in them. And, and yes, indeed, but there are some, I mean, in an atoll that big, there are some really fascinating differences and you can't make one sweeping generalization. So there are some where the water flow is definitely less and other areas where you just can't believe the richness of the life. They look even more rich than some of the outer reefs. So really important. Um, someone put in the chat. Um, Eric says, I don't really like the term westernization because industrialized societies are all over the world. With industrialization as the elephant in the room, how do we convince large scale societies who are becoming so heavily rooted or uprooted in consumerism, convenience and self um, indulgence to set things aside for the whole? Um, this is a big question. Um, <laughs> are these things um, that you've learned from your experiences that we could expand on a larger scale for modern society? So what are your takeaways? Well, you know, I know that I would be queen of the world if I could truly answer that question, Eric. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I want to be queen. But I will tell you that um, I think that one of the biggest things that I've seen in how to convince people to put things aside. I think the biggest thing is firstly, I know it sounds trite, but you, you know, we save what we love. And when you connect to an ecosystem, when you connect to people, then you can't not find a way to do something. And so even if you've never been to a place and you start connecting to, to them through what you're reading and sharing, or if you can get a chance to go. I mean, that's why I love so much, like taking people out onto reefs and you know, taking leading trips, even locally and around the world to bring people back to nature. And suddenly you find that the way that you're living on the planet changes because you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, if I drive my car today, that reef right there might start dying even more. And, and so it's just, I think it's nascent in, in us to want to start acting in ways that are supportive of that, which we love. I mean, <sighs> that's a fantastic answer. Thank you. And I think you have an audience full of people here who feel very much the same way, completely agree. Um, the, the sort of building the stewardship and connection to your environment, whether it be, you know, an island somewhere or whether it be your own backyard mm -hmm. is essential um, for the betterment of our future. Yes, yes, yes. So the Duncan family is wondering um, how their reef-based fisheries might be impacted by large-scale international fishing in the region. 
Um, is that a factor in this work that you're doing? Yes, I wish it wasn't. Um, and that's a, that's a really complex problem. And so one of the one of the amazing things about this particular ecosystem is that there are no commercial fisheries from the islands themselves, but we are strongly seeing the, the encroachment of big, large scale global fisheries. And, and that has been one of the approaches that we talked about early on is, um, you know, fish, you know, fish for your tuna, do it now because others are taking it faster than you can. And, and that resource is a really important resource for you and, and could help relieve some of the pressure on your reefs. Um, and so one of the one of the things too that's happening in a lot of these kind of communities is that um, big commercial interests will come in and often they'll sneak in in a way saying, hey, you know, I'm just like, you know, we're just this little group and could we buy your cucumbers off you? And so when when that happens, um, they they ask us, hey, you know, this person offered they would buy our cucumbers for like twenty dollars for a whole barrel of them. That's a lot of money. And and so we we share about, well, what is the role of that animal on the reef and what has happened to other communities who have sold and then how, how then, and then, oh, let's look at how much money they're getting for it on the global market and they're actually really cheating you. And so what is the, what is the impact of making that one decision? It could be a devastating impact. And so the communities are able to really protect themselves against that very strong. I mean, these are communities that have a lot of sovereignty about what happens. Um, but industrial fishing is a is a big issue. But it's also, I think, a really important point to drop in here to remember that the solution here, like we can't just say, hey, don't fish to that because this is the majority of their food resource. Absolutely. Uh, Larry Friesen wants to know, is Chinguaterra an issue? Chinguaterra. Um, we have not really seen much ciguatera out there. I mean, it definitely occurs out there, but we don't see it much. Well, I will share a comment um, from Jenny Anderson, also a phenomenal uh, female scientist. Um, she says that you've given an awesome talk and that your passion is so inspiring. You're a wonderful teacher and happy Valentine's Day to a special lady. <laughs> oh, Jenny, thank you so much for coming, Jenny is my predecessor here at City College and the, the most amazing marine science educator legend in this community. I'm sure most of you know her or maybe even took her class. And I'm just so honored to, to step into this role and I could never do it as well as you, Jenny, but I'm so honored to, that you came tonight. Thank you. For always just standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> <laughs> Toppling um, off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> depending on the day. Um, well, I have a question. I'm wondering about some of the work that you've done um, with students from City College about the opportunities you've had to take them um, out into the field and do research. How long have you been able to do that? And um, if you could share like maybe one really special memory that you have. Oh my gosh, there's so many, only one. Well, one of the first people to log in and say hello in the chat was Ethan Nash who came with me, so he's a student at City College, and um, he came with me to Belize. So I've done that, we've been able to do that both with um, this One People, One Reef through the youth group, and also with the, the trips that I lead with Oceanic Society, doing citizen science work and ecotourism. And um, so there, so Ethan is an example of a student who came out with me and, and was, um, an amazing just like learned how to identify corals and really just knocked it out of the park and and really helped collect a lot of data um, once the world was back open I mean you can come to City College and see the posters I have of students who have presented their work and come out so that's been a really special thing um, I have another student who actually worked for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. He was working in the Sea Center. And when you guys got your coral tank, Kevin fell in love with the corals and knew that I was studying them and so wanted to learn. And so we spent the last year working together over Zoom and he learned all these species of corals and has helped analyze the data. And he just presented his first scientific talk um, and with some of those data. So we have his poster up on our website. 
um, and this is a growing group of students um, who are coming together and and really getting involved in in learning about the reefs and finding ways to do science. And and then we bring students, you know, from the community colleges are our main group of students that we're wanting to draw to bring out on the youth program. And so um, there's been there's been several generations now of, of students that have come to Micronesia with us. And um, we can't get to Micronesia again this summer because of the continuing pandemic, but we are we are in conversation about trying to make an alternative program in Hawaii this summer. Um, so if there are youth out there that are interested in, in joining us, definitely reach out to us and, and we would love, we would love to bring you into our fold. We can't wait to meet you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, couple more questions here. Um, Nancy wants to know, are the larger cruise ships a huge issue um, and what can we do? They're not an issue there. <laughs> um, this is a pretty, it's a pretty remote area and there's also um, tightly controlled. So in that issue, they are a big issue, at, yes, in a lot of places. Um, one of the problems with those large cruise ships is they do pollute a lot. There's a lot of waste that happens from those ships. But there's also, a, um, in, in my, this is my opinion, but I see a kind of a degradation of culture around cruise ships because they create these little like sort of fake villages around the, the port and give people a very limited view. And they think they've just interfaced with a, a local culture, but they actually have interfaced with sort of a, a you know, a very orchestrated version of it. And, um, and also bringing in a lot of money, you know, there, it, I think it's important to think about the importance of revenue streams that ecotourism and tourism can bring, but how to do it in a way which is sustainable and that really supports the, the, the people who it really matters. So, um, yeah, but there's, there's, um, well, we'll see. I mean, we can even look to just kind of locally. I mean, well, we've had cruise ships coming here, but even just in, in Baja, we're seeing a new port that's going to be built um, in La Paz and that we'll see some big changes in that system with that. Um, Sue asks, which of these issues are most urgent and are we sort of running the clock out? <laughs> I know it you know I think that I think that um it, it it's all urgent and it's hard to I know it's a lot to swallow especially when you think about climate change because that's just like how do we stop that bus but um I will I I think that the most powerful thing is that I refuse to give up. I will fight and I will fail water to the last minute. Everything that we can do to keep this beautiful canoe of people together, working together, this culture afloat, we will do it because we have to. And that doesn't mean that each of us has to do everything. I think it's really important. You know, we, we always root, we kind of go back to this idea of the canoe and the sailing canoe. And, you know, this is the, this is the birthplace of Voyager canoes. And think about every person has a different role. And, and so every person is critical in their role, yet the whole thing couldn't happen without all of that diversity of roles. And so when you get overwhelmed with like, oh my gosh, how could I possibly do anything? just pick one thing and do a little bit, do a little bit, every little bit helps in a way. And you can also just support the people who are doing it. And sometimes just the people that are doing the heavy lifting, sometimes what they need is a meal. <laughs> and so how do you, how do you best support that? And so yes, our, our planet, you know, like the powers that be, we're doing a terrible job of recognizing the incredible crisis at hand, but I think people are really starting to get it. This is a time where I think so much has been revealed. I think one of the, the silver linings of the pandemic is how it's made people realize how incredibly connected we all are, how incredibly important community is, and how we are so fragile on this planet and 
what can we do to make sure that we live the best lives and the most sustainable lives and really create a future for our kids? That's, that won't, that if we live that way, we can make a positive impact, I believe. Well said, Michelle, well said. <laughs> All right, we'll end the evening on a, on a light hearted question. Uh, what's the night fishing scene like on the islands? Night fishing? Yeah, is there night fishing? Yeah, yeah. So that that was one of the things that I was alluding to that was actually become a problem was that with um, spear, spear guns are not a local traditional fishing tool. And so when people traveled to Hawaii a lot and brought back a lot of spear guns and torches, so they started to do a lot of night fishing and, and that really impacted the parrotfish. Uh, it's really easy to spear a pair of fish at night because they kind of just go like this and lie down and fall asleep on the reef and they're really bright and colorful and you can just, you know, it's not that <laughs> much of a sport. So, um, but one of the things that's been explored is the idea of setting up some little bit of ecotourism for offshore fishing because the, you know, the tuna fishing is great out there. I mean, and we've definitely had the best fresh tuna <laughs> out there. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, there's some deep water. There's some deep offshore waters all around there. It's a lot of ocean. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Michelle. You are a powerhouse. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, it's been really lovely. So many lovely words for you, Michelle. Um, your work is phenomenal and inspiring. Um, the rest of you, we hope to see you all on March 14th for our next Science Club from Home, um, Garden Allies. So we hope to see you, th see you then. Thank uh, you so much, Michelle. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And thank you all for listening in on this sweet night. I hope you all have a wonderful Valentine's. It's such a gift to be able to share this with you. And, and I'm just a humble storyteller from a much bigger group. So. I want to acknowledge all of them. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Take care, everyone. <laughs>